The following production of Missing the Train is being broadcast as part of the CU ADC online season. Please be aware that this broadcast contains swearing, homophobic language, discussions of self-doubt and discussions of death and grief. The programme will run for approximately 45 minutes. We hope you enjoy the show. You're running down the stairs to a train station platform. You've mistimed your day and your train has already pulled into the station. You know that you could maybe make the train if you were a little faster, if you just sped up. But you don't. And the train doors close and the train begins to move away from the platform. And the world changes. There was a version of you out there somewhere that got onto the train. Who was ten minutes earlier to your destination later that day, who had a few extra seconds on the train platform. And that version of you no longer exists. With one tiny action, you've changed your life. Welcome to Missing the Train. I think I must have been 16. Yeah, maybe 16 when I discovered it. It came as quite a shock, let me tell you. Although maybe that's misleading. Maybe it's not right saying it like that. Maybe discovery is the wrong word. More realisation. Because it was slower than discovery, and I think all the more horrifying for it. Yeah. I think I was 16 when I finally realised I'd become a person. It shocked me. As I said, it really did. It sort of annoyed me, if I'm honest, because I realised I had missed it. I had missed choosing what kind of person I would be. I'm not a punctual person. I'm late to a lot of things. But still, I never thought I might sleep through becoming myself. Because that's exactly what it felt like. Like I'd gone to bed maybe seven years old without a clue of myself, really. Hardly any identity. And then suddenly awoke, 16, and there I was. I'd chosen all these labels, all these mannerisms and personality traits, and I'd never even realised. They were like clothes spread out before me. And after I got up in the morning, I rolled over easily and I put them all on. I suppose I'd done it a lot. Every day for 10 years and I'd never even noticed never paid attention, because it started so small. Just little things. I'm eight years old. I like jokes. I like to laugh. I write my Fs with a little loop. Let's call this the underwear. And then it starts to get a little more definite. The choices start to shape how I act. I'm 12 years old. I don't really like big groups of people. I like drawing. I don't like football. At night, I stay up and I read in bed. This would be the trousers, maybe the belt. And then they get bigger, more defining. I'm 14 years old. I spend my free time daydreaming. I prefer dogs to cats. I like meeting new people, but I don't like talking to them. I want to live somewhere hot, with smooth limestone walls exactly like when I was little. This is the t-shirt, the jumper, the jacket. And then before I knew it, the decision started coming stronger, faster, more concrete. I sleep on my front. I like being outside. I take my tea with lots of milk and I forget to take my shoes off when I come home. I sweep my hair to the left. I eat my desserts with a fork. I peel the labels off bottles and I like to tear up leaves when I walk by hedges. I give up when things get difficult and I keep going even when things are pointless. I wear my socks inside out. I take writing very seriously. Each different trait was like another piece of clothing, another accessory, until one day I got out of bed and slipped on a whole personality. And so, yeah, it annoyed me. I wasn't ready to accept I would live bookishly. I wasn't sure I wanted to care about the arts. Maybe I would prefer team sports if I just gave them a proper chance. Sometimes I think I might reinvent myself, might throw away the persona I've chosen, and live a totally different way. But then I'll find myself slipping back into those patterns, with the way I talk to people, the way I solve problems, the way I think to myself. And I'll realise I can't change those things. Not really. You make those choices long before you understand their significance, and then you can't take them back, not ever. And I don't regret it, not at all. I'm happy with the person I am today, but a few little things. I just wish I'd been there to decide, that's all.
Hey, it's been a while. I thought I'd leave you a voicemail instead of just sending an email since someone gave me your number not long ago. Yeah, here I am. I was hoping we could catch up. I feel like the last time we met must have been just before the millennium because you went to study physics up north and you've been based there ever since. There is a reason I'm calling you, but I'll tell you in a bit. How's the research scholarship going? I read about that in the sixth form's alumni letter, if you're wondering. You always were very set on securing your future. I would always wait till push came to shove. I still haven't sent off my graduate scheme applications. Now, when the shove is very much there. Go, imagine if we were back in school, but with the foresight of everything up to now. I'd probably avoid all the mistakes. Be less embarrassing. Make everything I say sound. Profound, even. Cringing every day at your past self is a sign of growth, right? Maybe I'd do everything exactly the same. But appreciate the moment more. Not worry about the future. I don't know what I'm going on about. But food for thought. Give me a response. Or don't. Up to you. Right. Why am I really phoning you? Uh, you remember in year 7 when we sent a letter to someone 10 years in the future? Well, I got yours, and I read it. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. I hope you don't take any offence, but I sent mine to this boy who I found intriguing at the time. Uh, obviously, knowing me now, you can figure out what that was foreshadowing. He actually did get in contact with me after reading my letter. He's straight, but he wishes me well. Anyway, after reading your letter, I figured we should probably meet up soon. I think we're overdue. And I wanted to actually phone to tell you that. Let me know when you're free and also where. I'm happy to host you or make the trip up north. So I await your response, my good sire. I don't know why I went medieval there. Just get back to me at some point, okay? Bye! I can't remember the exact date and time that I decided that I found the boy I used to sit next to in the school choir incredibly attractive. I think I did genuinely like him in that sort of incredibly naive and painful way where he'd appear in the room and my heart would stop. And I'd imagine doing things with him and being referred to as his boyfriend and how that would make me really happy. A part of me did imagine that this all might happen even though there was basically no chance of it happening without it being an incident, in inverted commas. I mean, I was 14. I probably would have been told by half my class that I was disgusting, and if this resulted in me being bullied for being quote-unquote a faggot or similar, then I would have been told by some over-promoted figure of authority that, although homophobia was unacceptable and that school promoted tolerance and understanding, I was bringing it all on myself, and that perhaps I should think very long and very hard about what it was that I really wanted. If they were of a certain age, they probably would have told me that being gay is a very lonely existence indeed. Abolish private schools, that's all I'd say. I say all this to illustrate how innocuous the reason that I ever realised that I was queer was. I saw a film. Not that type of film for those laughing at the back, that would come later. I went to see Pride with my parents on a Sunday afternoon. It was pretty random that we ever went at all. Back then, we ended up seeing quite a few films at that sort of time, and that one just happened to be on. We decided to go around 25 minutes before the trailer started, so there was a decent chance that on another day there wouldn't have been any tickets, so we'd end up seeing a different film. We might have seen it the next week, or we might not have done. So I went to see a film, because we went to see films on a Sunday afternoon. And I sat watching this film, thinking, why are all the people on the screen like me? Why is it that I want to be them? I don't know why I want to be them, but then all the stuff that they do is everything I want to do. And then I went home and I couldn't listen to whatever song I'd been listening to while I was putting my shoes on because it didn't make any sense to keep listening to it. That's not to say it was a bad song, but it didn't work anymore because I wasn't the same person now. Because there was this possibility, a possibility I would hold on to for the four years before I actually came out when I doubted what I was on almost a daily basis, that I was like all those people in the film, and that someone was going to tell me, don't worry about being too visible this time, 
and that I'd have to hide a human league record down the back of my bookcase and that I'd dance like a queen on a series of folding tables and that I'd joke about ringing up a miner's lodge about their communal bats and that someone would refer to me as a screaming homosexual and that I'd only slightly joke about what the Welsh for lesbian was, that I'd go to gay clubs that weren't completely shit and that I'd tell someone that miners dig coal that makes electricity that lets you dance to Banana Rama till three in the morning and that when I came out, someone would tell me that they always knew. I wanted to be the Accrington Sodomite, even though I was born in South London, but you know what I mean. There should be a full stop in the script after that, but there isn't. My sexual and gender identities, in part, stem from seeing one not entirely accurate film, which nevertheless is probably the only time that I've ever seen people like me presented to the general public in an entirely positive sense. No one who has had any real power over me in the things I do, aside from my parents, has ever told me that what I am is something that someone can be, and that what I am is valid and equal to someone else being cis and straight. For whatever reason, the thing that set me off on being what I am now was a film that I saw because it was on. I assumed something else would have set me off, or that it would have just hit me once, but then that scares me because that moment could have been very late in my life. But the fact remains that my identity as a queer person, in an immediate sense, stems from me seeing a film. The reason why I grow my hair long, which if you haven't already guessed because you're a fucking idiot, is because it makes me look more feminine. After about a week of being here, I wore a shirt that said, Be Gay, Do Crimes, to a lecture, and wore it nervously for about an hour and a half before someone in our group brought it up, because I didn't want to hide anymore. Because in that film, queerness isn't something to be hidden, it's something to be excessively and outrageously. Something which people should know about you, and if they can't put up with it, then they can go fuck themselves. And that's not something I feel I lived up to for a long time. I probably don't live up to that now. I don't like to think that I can pass, but I know I can. And it hurts when I know that I have done. I look at myself in the mirror and know that there are things that I am but have not been. But a completely random event is the reason I get upset that people don't call me by the correct pronouns, which are they, them, if you were still wondering. I mean, they're in my email signature now, for fuck's sake. And I turned up to a seminar once in a skirt and a top that said, I don't fail to pass as one of you, you fail to pass as one of me. I first thought that I might be in some way queer almost four years before I actually came out. In those four years, I told one person about that in the most roundabout way possible that he still remembered when I came out properly. What I was, because of a film that showed me that being out and proud, in that terribly retro phrasing, was something that was possible, wasn't something I ever felt able to talk about. I alluded to it. I remember sending disco tunes back and forth with someone I know who might be listening to this. But I never said anything at the time. My queerness was something I knew existed, but wasn't something I'd admit, even when I'd have to tie my hair up because it was too long, because one's hair should not grow longer than one's collar, or some bullshit like that. Or when I'd get in from school and play It's a Sin repeatedly, because I'd known the words since I was seven, and it had become my own since I was 14. Or when I'd fancy, painfully, someone who sat two places across me in physics who was actually gay, and was my first experience of unrequited love. It was only when I came to Cambridge that I was ever properly out, and even then, in my first year, I thought that I was lying about something. I thought of my identity as something that existed, but as something that was strangely personal to me, as if I didn't and couldn't explain to anyone else, when, of course, I could. I just didn't try hard enough, and I will always regret that. I didn't try to work out what I was and what that meant. I just assumed that the process was done, when it wasn't and isn't. I remember someone saying that queer solidarity is a very powerful thing and I will always regret that I never looked for it or gave it out sooner. I will always be saddened by the fact that I, for a long time, never tried to live up to the example that I was set by that film. I should never have lied, but I did. And every time I'm completely honest, I am reminded of when I wasn't. I've always wanted to be a marine biologist. Science was my subject in school, 
My mother is a botanist, and by the age of seven, I could identify every plant in the garden or vegetable on my plate by its Latin name. The first word I learned to spell was not elephant, but chlorophyll. It was obvious to everyone that I would pursue biology. After grade 10, I went to boarding school. It was a school in the valley filled with ancient rocks. It was the hardest year of my life, both socially and academically. I went from being the class topper, having gotten 100% in math, to failing my first chemistry test. Physics was taught by Kumar Swami, sir, known to everyone as Ku. Ku is a legendary character. He had been part of the school since its inception and seemed to be as old as the rocks themselves. Yet he never aged. He carried a large silver torch and appeared mysteriously on dark nights, shining its powerful beam into the faces of guilty students. His voice was a hoarse whisper that silenced the most exuberant crowd. Ku's diminutive figure intimidated the whole school. Generations from, of students from 50 years ago still remember his torch. In our first physics class, Ku walked into the room and drew an arrow on the board, and he said, this is a vector. And then he drew an angle and said, this is theta. And I dutifully copied that down into my notebook, but did not understand a word that followed. So since I changed uh, schooling systems from CBSE to ISC, I didn't have the same academic background as my classmates because I had studied different things in 10th grade. So I did not understand a word of what was happening in physics class. And somewhere in the second week, uh, Ku gave us a homework assignment. And um, when we came back to class the next day, he realized that none of us uh, had been able to solve a single problem. So he gave us the same questions from the assignment as a surprise test. And all of us were working in strained silence in class. And um, I was determined to achieve something. So I solved one problem. And I carried my notebook to the teacher's desk full of excitement and hoping I had gotten it right. And uh, he looked at it and said, what is this? All wrong. Do it again. So completely dejected and crestfallen, I went back to my desk and prepared to sit and just wait the hour out in hopelessness. And then another girl who was also a fresher and who had become my friend approached me and asked me to come with her to the girl's bathroom. I didn't know what it was all about. I had never been to the girl's bathroom, but I followed her. Um, she shut the door behind us and she asked, did you understand anything in physics? I said, no, do you? And she said, no, I don't. Should we drop it? And I said, okay. Um, and it had never occurred to me before that dropping the subject was an option. I always thought I was stuck with all four sciences, but we went directly from the girl's bathroom to the principal's office and uh, put in our request to change subjects. The principal looked at us and said, are you sure about this? Have you talked to your parents? Have you thought this through? And we never returned to that physics class. So there were two options of um, what subject I could take in lieu of physics. One was literature and one was accounts. And I certainly wasn't going to do accounts. My friend had the option of art, but I couldn't do that. So that is how I ended up being the only student in my class with a combination of math, chemistry, biology, and English literature. In no time at all, literature became the class I lived for. It was the only subject that thrilled me, the only thing I looked forward to each week. I'd always loved reading, but I'd never known that English was a valid subject to pursue academically. Fiction had always been an escape from dull reality, but ironically, studying it made me feel for the first time that I was a part of the real world. I realized that politics was not just about politicians, but about real people. And I started to care so deeply that it hurt. I'd always preferred plants and animals to humans, but reading a novel about Palestine, I cried all night. It changed who I was. After two years, I got into an excellent university where I could study biology. I had not heard anything from the other institution to which I applied. And yet, with no backup plan, I rejected the high quality program that offered me a place because in the other university, I could study English literature.
right now, I'm doing an interdisciplinary MPhil in Cambridge's geography department. I may yet become a marine biologist. The humanities are still looked down upon in India. But as an English major, I was in another world. Classes in my undergraduate first semester shifted the tilt of the universe. Subsequent years became more difficult as I grappled with issues of ethics and identity. I couldn't separate my personal problems from academic ones. It pushed me harder and further than I'd ever gone before. There was darkness more intense than I could have ever imagined, but there was exhilaration too and limitless love. Nothing else could have enabled me to get into Cambridge. This is the reason why I'm here. Hey, it's been a while. I hope this cassette has made it to you. I also hope you have a cassette player over there. If you can, why not record a response onto the other side of a tape and send it back? Let me know how the commune is treating you. Mind you, I'm sure the web won't be causing you any grief. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you why you moved there. I know a lot of people ask that. Of course, if the fact that I'm not asking makes you more inclined to spill the beans, be my guest. Not spill the beans. This isn't gossip. It's just where you've lived for the past three years, isn't it? Do you get much access to the outside world? Radios are primitive enough, right? And I've read that selling excess crops gets the community a half-decent income. Maybe people are interested in where those crops came from. I'm wondering if you'd be interested if I told you what I've done recently. But I feel like it'll all be too rat race, consumer capitalist for you. You've escaped the system. Well, this system. You are in another system, let's not forget that. I hope you're still out to have medicine and books and stuff, for bits of modern life that aren't rubbish. This is a bit off topic, but my right ear was blocked recently, and I was able to phone a GP, I was told to put olive oil in my ear to soften the wax, and then a week later, a nurse squirted some water in there and it all poured out. It wasn't a huge deal, but it was irritating. Honestly, such a relief when it ended. I remember thinking that if this was the Stone Age, or 200 years ago, or 100 years even, I would just have to live with not being able to hear properly through one ear for the rest of my life. I hope you enjoyed having 2020 hero because now it's gone forever. I know that's not the phrase, but still, you get my point. Sorry, I'm not here to question your way of life. I just need to know that you're healthy and happy. So please respond. Please update me. Okay, message over. Hiya. Hi. It's me again. Don't know why I always say that. Don't know who else it could be. I had a fight with my mum again yesterday. She heard me on the phone to you again, leaving a voicemail. She doesn't think it's healthy. That's why the call was cut short. You probably heard her interrupt me. Anyway. So I'm sat on the fire exit, outside the hospital. It's bloody cold already, and I never finish work early enough to see the sunset, even though you used to like them, so I always try. Maybe I am crazy. I don't know. Why are hospitals so ugly? It doesn't look like any thought's been put into them at all, even though this is where people come to die. Right? You'd think that that would be a significant enough building to make pretty. I mean, even, like, fire stations can look cool. Hospitals are just an eyesore. Maybe it would seem frivolous for something so practical to be anything other than practical. Maybe it would seem disrespectful if hospitals were beautiful. I had to give... Yeah had to give some of the worst news I've ever had to give today. I haven't cried for years and years on the job, and you know that, but today, it makes you think, doesn't it, how quickly life can change. It can be instant, a snap second decision, 
a decision that doesn't even really feel like a decision. It's just something so random and accidental that it almost feels inevitable. A little girl died in the ward today. Not that that's unusual or ever not tragic or, I don't know. Maybe I've become soft in my old age. You always said I was too tough. Yeah. Did people used to get run over before cars? Did horses and carriages cause as many accidents? As much devastation? Maybe. Maybe. There was an ice cream van on the little girl's street. Even that's random, it's nearly October. Was it warm today? What do ice cream men even do in the winter anyway? The girl asked her mum for ice cream money. Mum said no, then found a couple of coins at the bottom of her purse. That's what she couldn't stop fixating on. What if she hadn't found the coins? What if she'd decided it was too soon until dinner? What if her daughter had looked both ways before running out into the road? What if, what if, what if? A thousand tiny decisions and mistakes and now she'll never see her daughter again. It makes me wonder if there's something I could have done to make you stay. Is there anything any of us can do or is it just one fucking thing after another? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bit crazy. Maybe I shouldn't leave messages on a dead man's voicemail. I don't know. I miss you. Sometimes the worst doesn't happen. Sometimes you make what is, looking back, objectively the wrong choice. And things still work out well. And that's just how the universe works. Anyway, when I was 12, I got Twitter. I was obsessed with getting as much out of the internet as possible when I was younger. My parents had explicitly told me I was not allowed to get Facebook. So I made one under a fake name, which they're only finding out about as they listen to this. Sorry. But I got bored of this pretty quickly and decided to branch out. Twitter seemed like the obvious choice. Tumblr was kind of scary, Instagram was for cool people. Twitter sounded just about right. I also don't want to make it seem like I was entirely naive. I got the same internet safety talks that anyone else our age got, in the sense that it was heavily implied that if I ever made a friend on the internet, they'd turn out to be trying to kidnap me and wear my skin. Using all the intellect the world had given me at 12, I decided this was probably an over-exaggeration and set about trying to make new friends. There was a point before I tweeted at someone for the first time where I remember thinking, I'm not supposed to be doing this. And I sort of sat there in my bed, probably still in my school uniform, thinking, I've been told not to do this, so I really shouldn't. And I was a very well-behaved child. I did what I was told, and I generally didn't go against what I was supposed to do. But in a moment of misguided preteen rebellion, I hit send. I don't think the tweet was anything particularly special, but it started something great. The person I tweeted, we're going to call Kai, because that's not his name and I don't want to use his real name. <laughs> Kai was 19, and a pansexual trans man, a series of words I didn't really understand at the time. Kai seemed vaguely baffled as to why this strange 12-year-old on the internet wanted to be his friend, but he rolled with it. We mainly just talked about bands and YouTubers that we liked, with the occasional chat about mental health. Why is this important, though? Why does it matter that I once chatted to a random man on the internet who turned out to be nice? Well, because Kai was the first person I ever came out to. I knew for a long time that I was attracted to girls, and I was terrified. I felt like if I told anyone at my all-girls school, they'd think I was attracted to them, and then I wouldn't have any friends. Or if I told someone else, they'd just say that I was too young to know, or was going through a phase. So I told the one person for whom I thought this information would have no consequences. The random stranger on the internet who I had decided I was friends with. He thanked me for telling him. He helped me figure out that yes, this was real, and I wasn't just imagining my attraction to other girls. And he reassured me that things would be fine. 
I came out to Kai, and with the confidence behind that, I came out to my friends. And then my parents, and eventually got to a point where I stopped having to come out to people because I could be so fully and unashamedly myself that my sexuality never came as a surprise to people, at least not people I cared about. There's no real ending to this story. Kai and I drifted apart when I deleted Twitter for the first time, and we've spoken a couple of times since to check in on each other, but it's not like we're close. He's living his life and I'm living mine. I've tried to pass on the good deed, to be there for other people who don't know where they are in the world yet, but I've never had an experience quite like it before or since. I think it was just one of those situations where a person just happened entirely by chance to be in exactly the right place to help another person. Our paths crossed for a moment because of chance and because of choices, and then they diverged again. And because of that, we are not the same. Hey, it's been a while. Well, I say that, but it's only been a long time for me. I guess I should tell you what's happened since you went into the facility. They said they passed on a recording if I made one for you. Uh, first off, a postcard arrived through the door of my parents' house two years ago. It had our address, but the postcode was two streets over. And we're used to having our mail at 21 Banlieu Street and the mail for 21 Banlieu Road mixed up. So there were two other houses it could have been meant for. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this is because all the writing was Japanese, and obviously so is your dad's side of your family. I thought it might have something to do with you, because we let you use our address to get into the better catchment area for secondary school. We returned it to the sender, so I guess we'll never know. But I thought you'd find it amusing. I actually have no idea why that's the first thing I told you. I guess I'm a little bit nervous, because you haven't changed, and I have. That's going to be a whole thing. Sadly, Mammy died not long ago, but she made it to 101. We had a big party when she hit 100. She wasn't quite there mentally, but she still recognised all the music, so she was with us during the celebration. Her decline was a lot shorter than my mum's mum. That took about 10 years, and we couldn't fly over as much as we wanted. Of course, that all happened before you were frozen, so you heard about that. It's funny... I never really thought of you as a distant relative. Not in a bad way. Like, we're friends more than second cousins, right? Anyway, I went to university, then I got a job, which, granted, sounds less interesting than I was frozen for five years. Actually, I need to know, does this make you five years younger or are we still the same age? No. More interesting question. What do you want to do now? Like, after you've been on some talk shows as the most intrepid human guinea pig or whatever, is everything going back to normal? I never really knew why you did this in the first place, but knowing you, you're probably never going to say. Still, you are going to get asked that on TV, so come up with something not too anticlimactic, okay? I guess I could update you on the news, any events or elections, but you'll probably get filled in on all that by facility staff. I'm wondering what else to say. Like, there are loads of things I could say, but if you've just woken up after half a decade, what could I say that compares to that? I'm overthinking this, aren't I? We'll have time to catch up. Probably. I've heard rumours about the side effects. Touch wood. Just promise me to look after yourself now. And good luck readjusting. Okay, I'll see you soon, I guess. Uh, hello? Uh, hi. Is it okay if I sit here? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh god. Oh shit. What now? What now? What now? Well, I know I was going to have to ask the essentials. Name, subject, where he's from. Oh god, I was going to have to explain where I'm from and why I don't have an accent. And wow, he was wearing a really stupid badge. I was hoping she'd ask me about the badge. I only wore it so people would ask. Nice badge. Thanks. Well, that went well. I remember being a bit annoyed that I found it funny. So, uh, what's your name? Uh, Archie. And you? Ella. And, uh, what are you studying? Oh, uh, English. Oh, cool. Um, I'm doing history. Nice, nice. I did history A-level. Oh, same. Obviously. Then he made some joke about a mixtape. To this day, I still don't really understand it. I thought I'd tell a great joke about a mixtape. 
I guess this fire safety talk is probably going to mention my mixtape. <laughs> you, you know, because because fire. Oh yeah, I got it. Oh, good. I remember this moment. Oh fuck, being the most appropriate sentiment. I then think I asked her where she was from. Oh, so where are you from then? Good pivot, nice. Don't have to pretend to understand the joke anymore. Oh, uh, Edinburgh, but I grew up in London. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Oh, uh, London. <laughs> yeah, what about you? Plymouth. Though, I don't actually have the accent. Oh, the accent's a theme with you then. I, uh, I dabble. I would go on to learn they very much were. Accents. All the time. Can I have your attention, please, everyone? Right. Now, we're going to play a short video about fire safety in the college. God, I Not hope I haven't long, scared her. Just I just worry that I can come off a bit awkward, which I make up for by just being additionally weird. I told myself when I came to uni that I tried to be as much myself as possible, because it's only worth making friends with people who actually appreciate you. It's still terrifying to try and do, though. I know if I hadn't met my best friend by awkwardly and nervously being myself, then I may well have just given up trying. But I didn't. Because since that fire safety talk where I wore a deliberately edgy badge, Ella has always been my absolute rock here. There's no better friend to spend the short time we have at uni with. She's always been there for me, and I hope I've always been there for her as well, because she really is one of those rare people who you just can't help but love. It feels weird to look back on that now and remember that two weeks later we were college married and glued to each other's sides. My mum always used to tell me I'd find my people at university, and I have. But there have also been people who have been and gone, because life here moves at double the speed it does everywhere else. And because that's always the way things happen. A natural part of life and living and thinking and feeling. But I think we have been each other's constant, through the weird times and the bad times and the crying times and the embarrassing times. And I know nobody better than Archie to go on a night walk at 9pm and stumble across some baby frogs with, or to have breakdowns with on the landing of our tiny second year house, or to open my arms to and have it feel like home. And what would have happened if we hadn't forced ourselves through that first horrendous conversation? Maybe it's naive, but I'd like to think we'd have ended up here somehow anyway. A different path, perhaps, like meet your friends or a chance conversation in the dining hall, but the same end point. Well, uh, that felt utterly pointless. <laughs> what, you didn't enjoy the weirdly edited cuts of a completely burned down kitchen? I, I don't think it'll be winning any Oscars anytime soon. A BAFTA, maybe. <laughs> Are uh, you uh, doing the event in here later? Um, yeah, I think so. Cool, I'll, I'll see you then. I can come find you. Sounds good. See you then. Thank you for listening to this production of Missing the Train. It was written and performed by Jake Stewart, Louis Davis, Thomas Whitaker, Maya Girl, Ray Morris, Shakira Allen, Kerry and Krask, Ella Pound, and Archie Brier. It was directed by Kerry and Krask, assistant directed by Beth King, produced by Richard Sharman, edited by Lily Blundell, and sound designed by Hester Penny, with publicity designed by Charlie Foreman. To find out more about the CU ADC online season, please visit CU ADC on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Thank you for listening.